Hey guys, Alicia from Morning Hawk Creations. Today is the very realistic botching of a rhinoceros hornbill. The whole point behind me wanting to do the hornbill specifically with the ink tense pencils is I really wanted to push the limits of the media, find out where I could go with it, find out how intense I could make those colors before everything started to break down. I did do one thing very, very wrong, and that is I got so wrapped up into wanting to figure out how I was going to get this done that I forgot to turn the camera on. So I apologize, you missed about 20 minutes of me layering in a short layer of black to denote the upper bill from the lower bill, the pupil, and the area of the nostril. The second bad choice I made was because I wanted to make this a practice piece, not a finished piece I would intend on selling, I picked a cheap pad of sketch paper that I inherited. It was a heavier weight paper, but it was a rough tooth paper. And so the fine lines that I really wanted to express with the ink tense pencils didn't come out quite the way I wanted it. To me, they look a little soft, they look a little muddied. And I know that if I combined a different medium, such as colored pencils or acrylics, I would have gotten more of that sharpness that I was looking for. Now the good thing is, is that the Inktense pencils did a wonderful job translating the intensity of the color that I needed to achieve in the mandible of the hornbill. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why I picked this in particular bird to try this experiment out with. So to get the right bright colors, uh, we're in the, in the bill itself we're using the cadmium yellow, the cherry, which translates into a cadmium red medium hue. The mustard uh, color on the Derwent translates into a yellow oxide if you're looking to do this in a different media. The sepia ink kind of translates into a raw umber, so I can use that to cool down some of these bright reds. The willow color translates into a burnt umber color. The Derwent baked earth color translates into a burnt sienna. Their deep blue is closest to what is commonly known as an ultramarine. So if I botch the names of these as I'm going along, kind of understand that these ink tents are still real new to me, so I may miss say which color I'm using. So to lay in those light colors and those real, real bright highlighted areas on the beak, we're going with that cad yellow. And then accenting it with the mustard yellow, which is that uh, yellow oxide. To get the underside of this horn done, we're doing the burnt umber and the raw umber combined with a little bit of burnt sienna and going back into that yellow oxide. Now the thing I didn't like about this goes back to that paper again. Just right there, I kind of got a little bit outside the line that I wanted to get. I was trying to hurry so I could come up with a quick tutorial rather than taking my time and executing it correctly. I had oversaturated the area in the upper horn and it bled. I lost my sharp line that I was looking for. The other thing that I noticed with this ink tense pencils and with super saturating the paper in order to get a nice soft gradient is that once you super saturate the paper, it pulls the tooth of the paper, and that's the texture on the paper. It pulls the tooth of the paper up so much that it doesn't really set back the same way. So where in the silver tutorial, when I was laying in lines uh, right by silver's eye, uh, and I was able to maintain that real crisp edge, uh, I went to go in on that upper mandible horn area, and it bled. Even though the paper was dry, it bled. I wasn't happy with it. I tried to lift it off, and it just wasn't going to happen. So that's something important that if you're looking to do something real exact, that either you want to lay in your contrast first before you saturate the paper to get a gradient color, or you're going to have to mix it with another media. The ink tense was really, really good and very forgiving in getting a lot of very intense colors. So I will say Derwent did give it a really good name. Uh, you do have to wait in between layers, dry the paper off as I'm doing here, let it settle back down, because uh, at some point, uh, as you can see in the corner of the upper bill, uh, it did start to lift off. So to get that really dark, dark red, we're mixing the raw umber, the ultramarine blue, and the cherry color 
uh, in order to get this it's a real almost purple red that really cool color red but a very intense red and then we're going into the yellow oxide and the cad yellow and the cad orange in order to give some dimension and the richness that this hornbill has and in layering it saturating it layering it it really did a very good job making a smooth gradient but again what I wasn't happy with is it pulled so much of the tooth of the paper up that once I wanted to go in and make that fine line, I wasn't able to get it to do what I wanted to do. And this hornbill, of course, has bright, bright, deep red eyes, uh, which I know sounds like a contradiction, but in some of them, they look really, really bright blood red, and other times they look really deep, deep red. So it's a very pop color, and I need to make sure that that color pops against the black of the feathers. Now you'll notice that I'm not doing this hornbill the way I do pretty much everything else. I did not start with the eyes and move out from the eyes. My focus was to see how much I could push the limits of these, this media in the horn, and that's why I picked this uh, species of bird, and that's why I'm focusing on that bill. If it started to go sideways, uh, I wanted to know before I got into too much anatomy, and then I'm talking about doing uh, you know, an eye study or, or this is how you draw a, man, uh, a hornbill, and then it, it just doesn't work or translate well. Now, one of the things that I did do is that after I went down this line and I realized that it had bled, even after I rested the paper and it continued to bleed, uh, I did have to go back in with some titanium white acrylic paint and kind of shore up the lines where the ink tents bled because the paper was oversaturated and establish those uh, crisp lines that I wanted for the exterior of the beak. So right there is a good example of what I was talking about in that other rabbit tutorial, where if you take a paintbrush and you run water down the chamber of the intense pencil where the ink is, and you saturate it with water, get yourself a clean 10 well palette, get some water in there, you can have more control uh, with variegations of strength of color and a more defined line. So one of the notations I also want to make is if you're using the ink tents straight on the paper and you're pulling it off, if you forget that you actually had the paper contacting the ink tents pencils itself, you might not have saturated that pigment enough that the next time you go over it in another layer, it's not going to lift off the paper and carry into an area that you don't necessarily want it in. So that's an important note, and that's one of the reasons why I keep going back and forth between putting the ink tents pencils on the paper and then carrying them over with just a paintbrush. So one of the things that I was hoping I could establish with this hornbill is the damage that's done to its beak. I, I, I took a picture of this at the Toledo Zoo out in Ohio and I did not have a docent or a zookeeper around to get the age on this bird, but it's very weathered and tore up beak, for lack of better terminology. Really just gave it a lot of character. It gave it a lot of contrast and it really drew my eye to it. Uh, we have another rhinoceros hornbill at our Milwaukee Zoo and he doesn't have nearly the damage done to his beak that this guy does, but I really liked how uh, the potential that it would have had in this media. The thing I didn't like about it is, again, in order to carry the gradient over the beak so that it had that rounded effect, once I went in to go get the detailing in, the ink bled. I couldn't establish that sharp line, and I couldn't get the detail, the real sharp detail that I wanted. So pushing the limits of the media again, that's one of the things that once you saturate the pa paper, ink tents cannot do very well. And going back and forth, and you see I'm kind of working around the eye right there. I did lay in the, the shadows and the low lights in the area around the eyelid. 
And then I went back through and I'm going through and backtracking and laying in some color over it. For those of you who are working in like black animals, the feathers on this uh, hornbill are black, but you, you work with it and automatically you default to it's a black animal, so I'm working with black colors or shades of black. And then you get done with that and you're like, oh, I don't like it, it looks flat. So initially I went and I laid in the, underneath the chin on that lower mandible that was originally laid in all with black. So if you go back through and you watch when I first lay it in, you'll notice how it looks really, really flat and there's no pop to it. In order to get black as a color, it's a black bird, a black cat, black horse, whatever animal that you have that you're painting that is a black color reg registered or not, you're going to need to figure out where it bleeds and reflects other colors. That's how you get that really beautiful looking uh, black coloring. It has less to do with whether or not your black actually works as a black and more interpretation of how it reflects color. So in this hornbill, it actually reflects a lot of blue and a lot of purple. And black can also reflect browns and greens. So one of the things I would recommend if you're working in a lot of black animals is study them, look at the surrounding areas that they're staged in. And if you need to, uh, both the GIMP and Photoshop have a, an eyedropper tool where you can go in and you can actually pinpoint the colors and then it'll tell you in a gradient graph where in the spectrum that black actually lies. And you probably would be very surprised to find out most of what your eye is interpreting as straight black is actually closer to a gray or an actual color rather than just straight on black. It may have some reds or blues or, or greens in it. Now in the under part of the horn part of the upper mandible and underneath the lower mandible where the the beak hits the jaw. That's not just straight black I'm going in with. I am going in with that CV ink slash raw umber, a little bit of burnt umber, and some ultramarine blue. Usually when you have a shadow lying in a color, regardless of if it's a hot color or a cool color, uh, it's going to kind of shadow it with a blue uh, to cool it down and tone it down. And if you think I just totally pulled that out of left field, I really didn't. Study some landscapes and see how a shadow lays down on a bunch of warm colored fall leaves. You're going to find out that those gradient colors actually lean more toward blue and less toward adding black to them. Again, after I let the paper rest for a little bit, going in trying to layer in some real, real deep colors, some rich colors. But by now, I'd already kind of done damage to the paper, and there was really not a lot of backtracking uh, with the fact that once I laid down another layer of the ink tents, that it was going to start to. All right, so that's pretty much going to wrap this up. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you took away a few bit of learning lessons that I had to figure out with using these Inktense pencils. I will try doing this hornbill again with a mixed media so I can get those sharp defined lines that were frustrating me with just the Inktense. Um, so look out for that if you're still really interested in doing more African birds and specifically this hornbill. And don't forget to... Leave me a comment if you got anything you want to say, and subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks a lot, guys. Talk to you later.